Hi class, um, on Friday I didn't finish a couple things and one was this problem I gave you on ozonolysis and the problem I had given you was <clears throat> a couple days ago was C, I said there was this unknown compound and the unknown compound had the formula C um, 12 H 16 okay and then I said upon catalytic hydrogenation which means adding Hydrogen with palladium on carbon, you would get H12, C12, H22. Okay, and so what we had done was we had worked on the um, on saturation numbers of these, and we had ascertained that the saturated formula for both of these is C6H26, and that's a difference of 10, which equals 5. So this is a highly unsaturated molecule. Now the catalytic hydrogenation gives you some insight into what kind of unsaturation you have. Because unsaturation can either be pi bonds or it can be rings. Um, we know five could be, for example, five double bonds. But the fact that C C12H16 was only converted into C12H22 means that, um, and the difference here is, so if you do this, this is C12H26. Okay, the difference is 4 divided by 2 equals 2. What this indicates is after it undergoes catalytic hydrogenation, it only has an unsaturation of 2. And what that means is that the, these two have to be rings because they made it through the process. Okay, so if something makes it through a catalytic hydrogenation process, it must be rings. And then what I told you at the end of the problem was um, that this compound upon ozonolysis, so when you take C12H16 um, and you submit it to ozonolysis excess to dimethyl sulfide excess, um, you will obtain the following molecules. You will get two equivalents of this molecule, two, and you will get two equivalents of this molecule. Okay? Now, what we were trying to establish in class is the fact that these ozone products are like little puzzles. And every place you have an O, that every place where you have two O's, that's where you had a double bond. So for example, one way I could lay this out would be um, I could say, well, it could have come from just to show you one thing, like this O could be linked to one of the O's from one of the rings. Like this. I'm just laying it out like puzzle pieces. And then this, I can't link another one here because if I do, I can't link the second equivalent in. So this, it's kind of like the way you do NMR because the way you do NMR is you figure out which are terminal pieces and which are internal pieces. These have to be internal because they have two carbonyls and these have to be peripheral or external pieces. So what we're going to do is I'm going to hook this here. I'm going to take another one of these and hook it up. This kind of teaches you NMR logic, problem solving logic, but it also teaches you how to think retrosynthetically because what you're saying is this comes from a certain functional group. And that's why they drill this in textbooks. So what would I get from this? Um, one possible final structure is this. You can think about this over the weekend, but this is not the only solution to this problem, all right? That's one possible structure. Now why? Think about this. This has the formula C12. This is C12H16, and you can count it up or do, do one saturation number to figure this out. It has a saturation of five. One, two, three, four, five. If you added excess hydrogen to this, it would absorb six hydrogens. That would bring it down to an unsaturation of two. So the other compound is this. So the hydrogenation problem, hydrogenation compound is C12H, um, as I told you, 22. Okay? So you have that. All right? The ozonolysis product comes from this one. So when this undergoes ozonolysis, 
remember what we said in class? It's like you're putting an O on each side of this and then just breaking it apart, okay? But there's another solution, and the other solution would be sort of like the stereoisomer of this. So the other solution would be like this. Okay, so this is the other solution. Um, the other solution would be if I tip this over, I want you to think about cis trans or ZE stereochemistry. That would be the other solution. Think about that. So this really would only lead to, you could only narrow it down to two things, basically, with this, um, this problem. Okay, there's a really good, what time am I at? 549. Okay, there's a really good problem in the text. Try text problem, not test problem, text problem, okay, for, uh, 546. It's a very good problem. Try that. It's very similar to what I just did and it'll drill this idea. Okay, now, um, in class, I was also doing these sugars, and I want to give you a little boost on this. I have another video on this I'm going to send you. But the way I did it in class is not the way I really do it, all right? Um, I personally don't do it that way, okay? So I kind of went over with you what D and L sugars are. So supposing I wanted to draw D and L mannose. I just want to show you how I would do it, and you can kind of integrate it in with that long process we went through in class. And I want to draw D and L mannose in the alpha um, Hayworth projection. Okay? Now what we went over in class is that ring cyclide, that sugar cyclides in water. So this, you'd have to look up on the table the structure of mannose. I do all my work from the perspective of the D sugar. I really do. I don't, I don't really think about L sugars unless I have to. Remember, D sugars are the natural sugars. So this is how I would do this, seriously. I would identify this carbon as the one that's going to undergo the change. Remember, we went over in some detail in class that this O comes up, attacks that carbonyl, and opens it. Now this is going to make more sense to you as the semester goes on, but this becomes an alcohol, and it becomes what is called the anomeric, this is called the anomeric carbon. Okay, this one down here, as you will recall, is called the configurational carbon. And I'm telling you, this is how I do it. And I, it, you say, oh, do you go through that whole process? No, I do not go through the whole process. If I'm drawing a D Hayworth, okay, what I will do is I always draw my ring like this. Okay, I draw my ring like this. And I told you in class, it's like this. Now what do I mean by like this? What I mean is, I put the oxygen in the upper right corner, if it's a D sugar. Then I go to this, and I just pick a direction for that OH. If the OH is down, this one is the anomeric. This is anomeric. Okay, the anomeric is the one that has two O's hooked to it. So I, I, if I put the OH down, it's alpha. If I put the OH up, it's beta. The way I've remembered that my whole life is just it's the opposite of what I think it should be. I know that sounds crazy. That's not the formal definition, but it works. If you've drawn the sugar this way, if the oxygen OH is down, it is the alpha anomer. Remember, at this carbon, there's a choice. Then I just envision the whole thing tipped over, and I just work my way through. So since this is on the left, the OH is going to be up. Since this is on the left, the OH is going to be up. Since this is on the right, the OH is going to be down. Since this is, this one has to be rotated around to figure it out. But I told you with these sugars, it's always the same. When you do that little rotation move that I showed you in class, the CH2OH group is always going to end up on the left, always, okay? So in these sugars, it's always up. So I'm going to draw it up like that. It's always up in these sugars. So that's the alpha anomer, and that's literally all I did there was I converted this into an OH, and I put it down because I wanted to make the alpha, and then I just worked my way through, and I said left, up, left, up, right, down, right, down, I know, and then I rotated this one, and this is always going to be up in a D sugar. Okay, now, supposing, I'm just showing you how easy this can be. Your life can be very easy. Supposing I want to draw the beta anomer, if I wanted to draw the beta anomer, I would go like this. 
I would just put the OH up like that. And then it would be up. These all stay the same because these are fixed. I was explaining that to you in class. Is this going to be any different? No, same deal. All right, so what if you're faced with drawing an L and a Hayworth, again, is when you draw this ring structure. What if I have to draw the L version of this molecule? All I have to do, if I want to draw L, alpha L mannose in Hayworth, look how easy this is. Like what you're saying, why did you spend a half hour on that the other day? I don't even know why I spent a half an hour. I'm starting to wonder about it myself. If I want to draw the L one, all I have to do is draw the mirror image, and that is actually the correct way to draw it. The textbook goes through a lot of stuff to get here, and I'm telling you, you don't have to do it. So if I just do this, see, I'm drawing like, a, I'm pretending there's a mirror there, and I'm drawing exactly the mirror reflection, even to the point where the O is in that corner, right? So if I wanted to draw the beta, try, to, try on your own to draw the beta L, okay? You would just draw the mirror image of that. So again, these, work with these. You can get to these very quickly. I'm going to do this again tomorrow in class real fast. I'm going to draw that sugar so fast you're going to be like, what were we doing? All right, then we're going to move on into amino acids. Realize with all of these, you could draw these in shares. So try, we'll do this tomorrow as an exercise, to try to draw in shares. Okay, try to draw them in shares. Because you could do this. So you could take this and draw a chair and just put the O there and then fill in all the groups and see if you can figure out what chairs are the most um, confirmationally correct. I know this kind of thing shows up on certain standardized tests that we don't really want to talk about. Okay, um, then tomorrow, well, just to give you a little jump start on things, we're going to start talking about amino acids. And, um, you know, amino acids are very important biomolecules because they're the building blocks of proteins. And proteins, of course, are also, you know, encompass the group enzymes. So they're very, very important molecules. And, and to understand enzymes and proteins, you really have to understand their structure, okay? So what I said to you is that the DL was used for amino acids as well as sugars, but natural amino acids were, were L, okay? So the way an amino acid works, with, and they're much simpler, is that you put the highest oxidized group on the top, and then instead of having an OH group, you're going to have an amino group. And you guys, knowing your functional groups, know that's an NH2 group. So my NH2 group would be on the left, like this. I'm drawing a fissure. And then there's some R group down here. And this R group varies. And you're going to learn 20, you're not going to learn them, but you're going to be familiar with 20 different R groups. So, so when you do an amino acid, what you do is you draw the carbon skeleton along the vertical. You put the highest oxidized group at the top, and you put the, if you put the amino group on the left, this is the um, L um, amino acid, and that's the natural one. In nature, they're all L. Now, L for you guys is about, is S. So you'll see that L really equals S most of the time. Okay, so, and then again, if I wanted the unnatural amino acid, and by the way, these unnatural amino acids do occur in nature. I think it's in, in a variety of places, but one place is with decomposing certain bacteria when they're decomposing things will interconvert the D to the L. So this would be the, um, the, R, D ship, the D amino acid. Now, again, this is unnatural, this is natural. So that's what we're gonna be working on tomorrow to get you ready for that. I have to give you a list of, um, of aromatics I'm gonna hold you responsible for. And I hope that um, the nomenclature is going okay. How much time have I used? 14 minutes. Okay, I'll see you in class.